friends. Let me introduce myself. Peltzer's the name, Rand Peltzer. And I have a story to tell. Well, go ahead, mister. Look around. See if there's something you like. What is that? Mogwai. I gotta have him. He's incredible. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a hundred dollars for him. I'm sorry. Mogwai, not for sale. Wait outside a moment. I'll be right out. Okay, mister. Here it is. Hey, listen, thanks. And have a Merry Christmas. -la 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 -la. Oh, thanks, Dad. You're gonna like this. What is it, a birdcage? No, 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 don't shake it. We're gonna have to open it now. We'll wait till Christmas. <laughs> what is it? It's my new pet. My dad gave it to me. Neat. What's his name? His name's Gizmo. Giz? He's a mogwai. Gizmo. You know, there's some things I forgot to tell you guys, and they're really important. Number one, he hates bright lights. We know that. But you got to keep him out of the sunlight. Sunlight will kill him. Number two, keep him away from water. Don't give him any water to drink. And whatever you do, don't give him a bath. One, two, three, four, five million. And probably the most important thing, don't ever feed him after midnight. In June of 1984, Gremlins made its debut in American theatres. It was Joe Dante's first big studio feature. He had come to many people's attention through his work on The Howling, which he directed in 1981. But Joe began his career working for Roger Corman. He started out cutting movies and trailers, and got his first chance to direct on the Jaws ripoff Piranha. Steven Spielberg optioned a script produced by Chris Columbus during the early stages of making E.T. He loved the concept and the idea of the Gremlins. Steven was hoping to produce a low-budget feature, but this changed down the line when the cost of making the Gremlins escalated. The production cost came to $11 million, which was still pretty cheap compared to other big summer movies at the time. It grossed $153 million in the United States alone and pulled in over $18 million on home rentals, so it was a huge success. It was also accompanied by a huge licensing campaign with tons of tie-ins from toys, stickers, plates, cereal and play sets. Anything and everything that could be sold was produced. Some critics said the movie could have made even more money if it was released at Christmas in the United States. Luckily for audiences in the UK and parts of Europe, it arrived in early December just in time for the Christmas period. It was re-released in the USA the following year in August. You'd think they'd re-release it at Christmas. The movie was given a PG rating. It was this and Temple of Doom that encouraged the MPAA to introduce a new rating, the PG-13. Gremlins wasn't really a movie for children, but like many of us we saw it as kids and loved it. But critics and concerned parents were a bit shocked by its level of violence, especially the fight in the kitchen where the mother traps a gremlin in a microwave. Many felt it might encourage many idiotic kids to do the same to their pets, which I don't believe ever happened, but the new rating was much needed. Chris Columbus's original draft wasn't really intended to be made into a film, but it was a sample script to be shopped around to studios. Chris had always wanted to write a horror, and his first draft was very violent and had less focus on comedy. In the original script, Gizmo turned into Stripe, the mother gets decapitated and the gremlins eat the dog. It went through about eight drafts before they finally settled on the one they intended to shoot. Even in the final draft, Gizmo still turned into Stripe, 
but Spielberg felt Gizmo was far too cute and wanted him to survive and help Billy at the end, so they had to quickly change things around to fit the new middle and end. You may notice once the gremlins come into play, there aren't many more close-up shots of Gizmo, they just rely on the small puppet throughout the film, which wasn't really as well animated as the rest. The film was shot around the Warner Brothers backlot for the Chinatown scenes and a number of streets later on in the film, but the Universal lot was used for most of the town of Kingston Falls. I'm sure many of you will recognise it from Back to the Future. The three rules about the Gremlins were added later on during the production. The crew found them odd, especially the no food after midnight rule. They argued it's always after midnight, making the rule pointless. This was made fun of in the sequel. But during screen tests, audiences never complained about the strange rule. Many of the sets featuring scenes with the Gremlins had to be built about three or four foot off the ground, so the team of puppeteers could work the Gremlins and Gizmo. Joe Dante saw the film as It's a Wonderful Life meets Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. They wanted the town to look a bit like a set, capturing those classic films. So if you think it looks a bit set bound and doesn't look that real, it's done on purpose. Gremlins has a very large cast of actors, many with smaller roles, and the movie really focuses around Billy and Kate. There are a number of cameos from Steven Spielberg, who drives past wearing a cast on his leg, composer Jerry Goldsmith, and the famous Warner Brothers animator Chuck Jones. Zach Galligan plays Billy Peltzer. This was Zach's first feature film, and I don't think he made any movies that were as popular as Gremlins and its sequel, but he always maintained a steady output of work, and for some reason he never ages. He still looks the same. Billy works as a cashier at his local bank, but seems far more interested in comic books and pursuing a career in being an artist. In a deleted scene, he goes through some of this. He also has a crush on his co-worker Kate. Phoebe Cates plays Kate, who works with Billy at the bank. I'm sure many lads had a crush on her after seeing her in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Her character does not celebrate Christmas after a shocking incident during the season when she was a child. Hoyt Axton plays Randall Peltzer. Before he started acting, he was a famous country singer and unfortunately passed away in 1999. He plays an inventor who is always struggling to sell his latest creations. His house is littered with his gadgets. Most of them only work for about two weeks before becoming faulty. That's a lot of juice on one orange. Frances Lee McCain stars as Lynn Peltzer, the mother of Billy. Lynn has appeared in many films and TV shows, popping up in Back to the Future, Stand By Me and Scream. She is a woman you don't want to mess with in the kitchen. Corey Feldman plays Pete, who often hangs out with Billy. Pete is a bit of a clumsy kid and unfortunately is the one who spills the water on Gizmo. Corey made a good impression on Steven Spielberg, which led to him being cast in The Goonies. Polly Holiday plays Mrs. Deagle, who is basically Scrooge. She has ties to the bank and has been coming down hard on those who are struggling with their debts and refuses to let up even during the Christmas period. Basically, she's an evil bitch. Judge Reinhold plays Gerard Hopkins, Billy's supervisor at the bank. He is a bit of an 80s yuppie. He's all about getting to the top quickly and making loads of money. He is only in the movie for a short while and then just disappears as the rest of his role was left on the cutting room floor. The extra scenes with him are featured on the DVD's deleted scenes where Billy and Kate discover Mrs. Deagle is forcing the bank to foreclose on all the outstanding mortgages in order to sell the land to a chemical plant. And later when the gremlins attack the town, Gerard locks himself up in the bank's safe and has gone a bit mad. Dick Miller plays Murray Futterman, who is a very right-wing conservative. He doesn't like anything foreign or stuff made outside America. He tells myths and stories of gremlins on when they were used during World War II to destroy the inner workings of planes and such. Dick Miller, I think, has made a cameo or been given a small role in all of Joe Dante's films, minus one or two. And finally, last but not least, Key Luke plays Mr. Wing, the owner of the antique store that owns the Mogwai. Key started out his career designing movie posters and moved into acting in the mid-30s and was called upon to play Chinese actors in many movies and TV shows, even providing the voice of Mr. Han in Enter the Dragon. He unfortunately passed away in 1991, just a year after working on Gremlins 2. The movie opens with the return of the classic Warner Brothers logo. For years it had been the Time Warner Communications design of red and black or just black and white. The story begins in Chinatown where inventor Randall Peltzer provides a short narration which actually was an afterthought and not in the shooting script. He is looking for an interesting gift for his son Billy. He is taken to an antique store and encounters a mogwai. He wants to buy the creature but the owner refuses to sell it telling the inventor that looking after a mogwai comes with great responsibility and he can't sell the mogwai at any price. His grandson tells Randall to wait outside. 
the family needs to cash in he sells a mogwai to Randall, but as he leaves he tells them the strict rules that come when owning a mogwai. Never expose it to bright light, especially sunlight, it will kill him. Never get it wet, and most important of all, never ever feed him after midnight. Randall returns to his hometown of Kingston Falls. Being an inventor, Randall calls the mogwai Gizmo, and gives it to his son Billy as an early Christmas present. Billy loves Gizmo and it is introduced to his young friend Pete, who accidentally spills water on him resulting in five new ones. But these new ones are not as cute or as kind as Gizmo. They torment the dog and bully Gizmo. Billy tells his dad about the new Mogwai and Randall sees it as a business opportunity, the perfect gift for children. Billy takes one of the new Mogwais to his former science teacher and they run some tests. However, these new Mogwai are devious. One swipes a sandwich left out by the science teacher and the others trick Billy into feeding them after midnight, after they have cut the power cable on his alarm clock. The next morning, all the new Mogwais have cocooned themselves in their eggs, which begin wobbling as the Mogwais change rapidly. All of them hatch at the same time and Gizmo hides, watching in horror as he sees the evil gremlins emerge and begin to cause chaos. Special effects expert Chris Wallace and his team had the tough task of creating the gremlins and Gizmo, creating large heads for the close-ups to get around the technical difficulties of achieving many of the shots they had to shoot in clever ways, using different camera speeds and thinking of ways to hide the puppeteers. Joe Dante cleverly hides the look of the gremlins until the big reveal in the kitchen, where you see them perfectly fully animated. Gizmo is by far the cutest thing on film. He purrs like a cat and makes all those cute noises and sounds. Voiced by Canadian comedian Howie Mandel, Stripe is voiced by famous voice artist Frank Welker. I think everyone wanted a Gizmo after watching it. In the sequel, he is beyond cute and so sweet, whilst in the first film there is more of a similarity between him and the gremlins. A good example is when he's playing the keyboard, and you can see that gremlin look in him, where in the sequel there is less of a connection. Gizmo couldn't walk in the film and they always shot around it. Even in the sequel, I don't think they managed to visualise that effect. I think with CGI it would be a piece of piss, but when you have these restrictions it forces the artist to be more creative. They came up with the clever idea of Gizmo being in Billy's backpack, to avoid any issues with him getting from one place to another. The gremlin eggs were all made out of latex, which provides that gross effect. The worst bit is when Stripe begins to multiply and you have those bubbles on his back, and when the sun rays blast through, he just melts in front of your eyes. It's an amazing achievement in special effects, and still looks great to this day. The movie does have two awesome map paintings, one at the beginning to expand the town of Kingston Falls, and at the end when Mr. Wing takes Gizmo home. The legendary Jerry Goldsmith pulls out another triumphant score. In typical Jerry fashion, he incorporates synthesizers with a full-scale orchestra. The Gremlin's Rag, which is the main theme for the Little Monsters, is very catchy and memorable. It kicks in when they smash into Mr. Futterman's house with his plow. My favourite pieces of music throughout the film is the theme tune for Gizmo, which is very emotional, and I love the creepy theme for the Gremlins, which sounds like Jerry has sampled the sound of a pissed-off cat. I was never a fan of the Mrs. Deagle theme tune, it's a bit too wacky for me. It works okay in the film, but as part of the score, it's a track I often skip. All of the upbeat and positive music, like the opening theme for the film, sounds a lot like John Williams. It's like Jerry is doing a nice tribute to his style of composing. His work was poorly released at the time on LP, with his work only appearing on Side 2. Side 1 had a splattering of pop music that featured throughout the film but many of the people picking up the soundtrack just wanted Jerry's work, and it wasn't released until 2011. Film Score Monthly released a two-disc set of Jerry's complete work on Gremlins, and it's still available for $25. Get it while you can. There was a Gremlins game produced for the Atari 2600 that was very basic. It was just you playing as Billy, or maybe his dad, as you moved back and forth trying to catch loads of Mogwai. Painfully dull, even in 1984. Apparently released in limited numbers, and if you have a boxed copy, it should be quite valuable. For Atari's more modern games console, the 5200, the game was delayed for two years down to Atari sorting out its finances and management after the video game crash. The game was apparently one of the last released for the 5200. 
You play as Billy and your goal is to gather up all the loose mogwai running around the screen and return them to their pen. Definitely a major improvement over the dreadful 2600 game. In 1985 a text based adventure was released for the Spectrum, Atari Electron, BBC Micro and Commodore 64, produced by AdventureSoft. This is a typical text based game. At the top of the screen there is a graphic, often partially animated, that shows the scene. In the lower part of the screen the player gets a text description of things he sees, indicating items you can interact with. It's an odd choice to go with this type of game. To be honest if you want a decent Gremlins game, play number 2 on the NES which is a fantastic top down platformer. After many failed attempts to get a sequel off the ground, Warner Brothers returned to Joe Dante and asked him would he do a follow up. Joe would only do it if he had full control, and the studio agreed with this, which is very rare for them to do. I will discuss Gremlins 2 in more detail in future, but it's a mad take on a sequel. It's a complete send up of the first film and makes fun of sequels in general, and satirises everything that people loved about the original. Its direction feels very much like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which was radically different to the 70s classic. Joe Dante actually prefers the sequel, but the movie certainly divided audiences and fans. I think it gets better with repeated viewing and the special effects by Rick Baker and his team are incredible. There has been talk of a remake for years, but nothing has materialised. British Telecom produced an advert featuring the Gremlins a few years back about IT support. The Gremlins come in and mess with all the computers. It's all done with puppets and the FX team managed to keep them close to the original 1984 design. It was a great surprise seeing this on TV. Gremlins is certainly one of the movies I've lumped into my yearly Christmas viewing list. It captures the look and feel of Christmas perfectly, especially with its great use of lighting in the bar and Billy's home. It just invokes loads of nostalgia for me. It was a movie that was always on over the holidays and I always try to watch it on Christmas Eve. I think the first half of the movie is strongest. Once Stripe begins to multiply at the pool, the tone becomes more comedic as the gremlins run rampant. It's not to say the first half has no humour, but I think the build up is where its strengths lie, and the attack on Billy's mother is executed extremely well. The shadows cast on the wall and the surprise attack on her as it hides in the tree are great moments of horror within this film. Just imagine walking upstairs and seeing that the eggs have been cracked open and they have escaped. You'd shit your pants and I'll be the first one to run out the front door, but that's just me. Billy's mother in the film is hard as nails and doesn't take shit from the gremlins. She will defend her kitchen. The movie doesn't play on women calling for help. They are strong characters, which I think is fantastic and makes a refreshing change, especially for a movie dealing with horror elements. Many felt Kate's speech, which was always in the script, wouldn't be in the final cut as the studio kept bugging Spielberg to cut the scene. Both Stephen and Joe shared final cut. Stephen didn't think much of it but said it was Joe's picture and he could do what he liked. Joe fought with the studio and it was kept in. It is one of the scenes that creeped you out as a kid and Phoebe plays it so well. You totally buy into it, but her dad was stupid. Who the hell climbs down a chimney to surprise their family? One thing I always wanted to know more about was Gizmo's backstory. Where did he come from and how old is he? In the novelisation of the film, the reader is actually offered an origin story. Supposedly the Mogwai were created as gentle creatures by a scientist on an alien world. However, it was discovered that their physiology was unstable. The end result was that only 1 in 10,000 Mogwai would retain their sweet loving demeanour. The rest would change into creatures that the novel referred to as mischievous. I don't buy the idea that aliens created them and I would rather not know to be honest. The cops are pretty lousy in Kingston Falls and there only appears to be two of them. Once they crash their car they are taken out of the picture and the town gets abandoned very quickly. There doesn't seem to be a desire to call for help outside the community. Have the gremlins killed most of the residents of the town or has everyone just gone into hiding? One thing that has always puzzled me is that the gremlins won't actually kill Gizmo. Stripe does attempt to shoot Gizmo at the end as a way to defend himself from being killed by the sun, but they only seem to bully him and beat him up especially in the sequel. I suppose he is still family despite them not liking him. With the changes made to the script and Gizmo's part in the finale, it does suffer the problem of what else can you do with him. He is just a cuddly sweet furball. He can't speak that much or offer advice so I think he is always pushed aside so the film can focus on the gremlins, which is kind of what you pay to see. The fight between Billy and Stripe could have been a total disaster. Fighting a small creature could have been laughable to see on screen, but they take it seriously 
with Billy getting a ball fired in his back. Oh, I felt that. Then an arrow to his arm, then Stripe charges at Billy with a chainsaw. Every attack on Billy gets more and more dangerous. The humour is great throughout. It's not in your face, but very subtle with its execution. What I find funniest are the silly noises the gremlins make, where one is in the bin spitting out letters. Then having Stripe looking for food. Yum. The ending when Gizmo has to say goodbye to Billy always chokes me up. I get teary eyed very quickly. His voice is just so cute! <coughs> Gremlins is probably Joe Dante's most famous film. Could it be his best? Um, it could be. He has done so many great flicks throughout the 80s and 90s. I love Inner Space, The Burbs, Matinee, heck, even Gremlins 2. You know what to expect with Joe, and I think he always delivers, but his style is not for everyone. Sometimes you do have to have a fondness for 50s B-movies, and to have a good knowledge of what he is trying to homage in some of his feature films. I hope you all still enjoy Gremlins as much as I do, and include it in your yearly Christmas viewing. I've never had any problems with this film, it has some flaws here and there, but that doesn't at all distract from its quality. So if your air conditioner goes on the fritz, your washing machine blows up or your DVD player conks out, before you call the repairman, turn on all the lights, check all the closets and cupboards, look under all the beds, because you never can tell, there just might be a gremlin in your house. Mom? Mom, could you come up here, please? What are they? Well, they're the Mogwai, I guess. Except for Gizmo. Did you get them wet or something? No. Did you feed them after midnight? Well, I gave them some chicken. But I made sure that it... No, 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 wait a minute. I made sure. Mom? What's going on here? Mom, it's Stripe. <coughs> Huh? Little monsters. Right. Hundreds of them. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe thousands. Wow. <laughs> Look, I know it sounds crazy. I know it does. But in a matter of hours, this town is going to be turned into a major disaster area. Now you have got to warn people. You think this kid is drunk, Brett? No, you are, huh? <laughs> If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find more retrospective reviews by clicking on these videos. If you want to watch my upcoming reviews early before they go live on YouTube, you can support me through Patreon. Don't forget the poster designed by my talented artist Peter Bruce, celebrating 100 retrospectives, is still available to purchase. We ship worldwide and postage is affordable. <laughs>